Let's talk about how to generate some randomized characters. I just want to kick this video off by giving a big thank you to anyone who has downloaded the FZ randomizer and used it so far. But I especially want to thank those who have donated to the creation of this plugin. Together, everybody's support has made it possible for me to bring you two major updates to the add-on. One, a rarity system, and two, an option to export your variant data to a CSV document. The best way to comprehend how the rarity feature works is to think of the whole system as sort of a lottery. The system will select one winner for each subcollection or each attribute, whether that's a hat, a shirt, a pair of pants, a hairstyle. If we think of this in terms of a lottery, the system will draw one ticket as the winner. Essentially, each object within the subcollection is carrying one ticket. So for example, say we have two objects, and each object has one ticket, or one chance to win. That is a 50-50 chance of being selected. If you have three objects, each object still has one chance to win, but now it is a one-third chance of being selected. Obviously, you get how this works. This is how the 2.0 version functions. What's new in this update is that you now have the option to hand out new tickets per each object to make objects more or less frequently selected. So let's go back to the two object scenario to see how this works. We begin with each object having one ticket, a 50-50 chance for each object. If we decide to give the first object nine tickets rather than one, a few things have happened. We've increased the total number of tickets in the ticket pool to 10. Not only have the odds of object one changed to nine out of 10, or a 90% chance of being selected, but on the other end, the odds of object two have in turn decreased to one out of 10, or a 10% chance of being selected. You can see how one object's ticket count directly affects the others. Now this lottery is a closed system, which means objects outside of the subcollection do not affect the rarity of the objects within that subcollection. So you have multiple lotteries happening to create one overarching variant at the very end. Export to CSV. So for this update, a lot of people asked for metadata. With that being said, I don't know how each individual person is going to need their data stored for their specific needs, whether they need a JSON file or a text file or an Excel document. So I just included this option to export all the data as a CSV document. You can convert and manipulate the data as you see fit after it's in this file format. If you have the feature turned on, it will simply just generate the CSV document in the root folder where your project is saved. Let's build a collection of random characters from the beginning so you can see how it's done. One quick mention, there was actually a bug in version 2.0 which threw an error code anytime you tried to uninstall the add-on. No big deal. Just uncheck the marker and then hit remove at the bottom. You will get the error code, but it's okay. You'll hit remove and then you'll close Blender. Once you reopen Blender, you should have no sign of the initial plugin. Then you can just go through the typical steps of going to edit, preferences, add-ons, and then installing version 2.1. Yeah, sorry about that. But now you're good to go. For this example, I've already created all of the attributes my characters will use, such as the body objects, the face objects, the hat objects, the hands, other objects that you could use. These are called our attributes, or our subcollections. These subcollections go within the host collection, which I'm creating right now. I've named my host collection Ghost, because for this example, we're creating a collection of ghosts. I'll begin by creating my first subcollection of attributes. In this subcollection will contain all of the body items. For my example, I've only used one body, and it's perfectly fine to have a subcollection with only one object in it. I'll move that body object to the specified subcollection, which in this case is body. Let's move on to the face items. Now the face is the first spot where I have multiple objects, or what I would call variation. Within the collection, you'll find an angry face, a sad face, an unfazed face, and a VR headset. Let's put them all together and drop them back into their own specified subcollection called face. Again, this subcollection goes inside of our host collection. Moving on to the caps, I built a headband and a Santa hat. As we did before, we'll make a new subcollection for these attributes. We'll call it caps. Moving on to the hand objects, I have one hand object in the down position, one hand object in the up position, as well as one hand object I just called Kevin. Again, we'll move all three of those hand objects into a new subcollection called hands. 
And finally, for the waste sub collection, there's three objects. One, a fanny pack. Two, an object called no waste, so that way there's an option for nothing to be selected as a possibility, as well as a sword with a belt. And just like before, we can move all three of these objects into a new sub collection inside of the host collection. Awesome, now we've finished the structure for our character randomizer. Now let's move on to material libraries, or matlibs. A matlib can act as a library for specified objects to pull random materials from, hence the name. At this stage, using a matlib is not included in counting possibilities towards unique generations. To have a specified material count towards a unique possibility, you'll need to duplicate the object within the subcollection and manually add that material to that object. Doing it this way even allows you to access the rarity system for a specified material as well. I'll go into more detail on rarity later in this video. For this example, we only need to use two. But if you need to, the randomizer allows you to use up to 10 matlibs, spots 0 to 9. Setting up a material library is actually very easy. Add in any random object, and by pressing F2, you can rename this object to a very specific term, matlib, in all caps, M-A-T-L-I-B. I then follow this with an underscore, and I usually write anything after this that sort of defines what this material library is for me, so I know. If you look up in the outliner, you'll then see your object is listed up there as an object in the scene. For this to work properly, make sure the material library is sitting in the root folder of the host collection rather than within a specific subcollection. Going back to the viewport, we can then tab into edit mode and delete all of the mesh data within this object. Now, this object is just an empty container for mesh, and we'll leave it that way. Your matlib is now properly set up, and you can see it's still living here in the outliner. If you move down to the material slots, we can just begin adding in all of the materials that need to live inside of this material library. I'll start by working on the material library for the ghost skin. To do this, I'll select the body object, as it's the only object that needs to access a random material from the ghost matlib. A group of objects that all access the same material library are referred to as a link mat group. With the body selected, we will define our first link mat group. I'll scroll down to the advanced material options and set the link mat group to zero. When I click set link mat, our body is now placed into link mat group zero, as depicted by this prefix here. The process isn't complete until we connect one of our mat libs to the link mat group as well. I select the mat lib object and follow the same process. Make sure that the link mat group is set to zero and then click set link mat group. And finally, for this to work, you need to have a default material already on your subcollection objects. If you remember from the last version, it's still very important to make sure that the material slot is set to object link rather than data link. By default, material slots are set to data link, so you will need to change that so the matlib knows where to apply the material to. I'm going to set up the second material library now. Notice how this Santa hat has multiple materials on it. Well, link mat groups and material libraries only occupy the first material slot, so that gives you options to randomize objects that need to use multiple materials where some need to stay the same. For example, here, I only want to change the actual color of the Santa hat, leaving the white band and the white puff at the top of the hat. I'll select both objects within the sub-collection that need to access the material library and set them to link mat group 1. Why 1? Well, Remember, our last material library occupied link mat group 0, so we need to be sure that we're actually occupying a different link mat group, so that way we're not causing any overlap between the other material libraries. Let's move on to Rarity. Now remember, Rarity should be treated like a lottery system. In this example, I want the VR headset to be the most rare item, or the least likely to be picked, which means it needs to have the least amount of tickets in the lottery system. To do this, we'll increase the amount of tickets for all the other objects within that sub-collection. By selecting all the other objects, you can type into the tickets box the number of tickets you'd like to be assigned per each item. I'll give the others five tickets in this case. To set this ticket count to all the objects, hold Alt and then hit Enter. This assigns that ticket count to all selected objects rather than just the active object. You'll see that as you select each object within the sub-collection, the Rarity panel will give you a readout of multiple pieces of data. That includes the sub-collection, the object's name, the ticket count, and the Rarity listed in a fraction form as well as a percent form. This Rarity is calculated by the number of tickets this object has 
divided by the number of total tickets within the subcollection. Each object starts with one ticket by default, but that number is just a default. If you know you're going to be using rarity on multiple objects, feel free to select all of your objects within the subcollection and just from the beginning set all of the tickets to a higher number, like 10 or 100 or something. This gives you maybe a better starting place to drop down from as you try to figure out the rarity of your subcollections. I'm now just going through and setting the rarity for the rest of the objects within the subcollections based on what we've already seen. Objects like the VR headset, weightlifting Kevin hands, and the belt sword will all be rare items, meaning they'll have less tickets than the others. And remember, at any point in time you can just look down on the rarity panel for that object and it will tell you what the rarity currently is based on other objects within its subcollection. So we've set up the structure of our characters, we've set up the material libraries, the link mats, as well as the rarity. Let's get ready to generate some of these characters. The first step is actually make sure your host collection is typed out here properly. This is case sensitive. I'll run my calculate possibilities function here to find out I have exactly 108 unique possibilities that are possible. This means you can't go over this number if you're trying to generate unique characters. But Logan, I need more characters than that. I need more variations than that. Okay, then we got to put in some more work. We just need more attributes. We need more things. So right now, I said we need more things. So I'm going to make another set of hands. I'm going to make some tiny hands. And literally just in making one extra set of hands, my possibility count jumped up to 144. And that's because this is an exponential process. Think about it. If we add more attributes, we're not just adding like two or three more attributes so there's two or three more possibilities. No, it's two or three times the possibilities of before. So it's always very important to have lots of variation so you can bring that number of possibilities up. I would always recommend to make sure that your possibility count is always at least double the amount of variance you're trying to calculate. And if it's not, it can even go as far as negatively impacting the accuracy of your rarity features. So let's keep moving. In this case, I don't need to generate unique ones. I'll also leave the instance box checked because I'm not going to be changing any of the shape keys, so it's totally fine to instance this mesh data rather than having to recreate it. We'll give it 60 variants. Our final step is to decide whether or not we want to write to a CSV document and record all this data somewhere in a spreadsheet. By default, this saves in the root folder of where your project is saved, so be sure to save your project before doing this at all. And by default, the CSV document will be named variant underscore data dot CSV, so feel free to change the name accordingly for your project. And just make sure you leave the dot CSV in the text box. I'll now hit generate to run the actual variant generation process. And there we have it, 60 random variants now generated and in our variants folder. I'll turn off my host collection so we can get a better, cleaner look at all of the spawns we have. By going into our spawn tools, we can click Q for batch render to sort of clean up the scene and look at each one individually. This function sets the scene frame length to the number of variants and sets each variant to a frame in the scene. One small update from the 2.0 version is you can now use the arrow keys to parse through your variants in the viewport rather than having to wait till the render. It makes it much easier to see what you're working with before you have to render everything. And as you can see, I'm just using the arrow keys to go through one by one and look at each variant I generated. And as you can see, we don't have many VR headsets, um, except for maybe one right here. Come on, let's get a, let's get a VR headset. Where are we at? Where are we at? Where are we at? Are we going to get one? They're rare. They're really rare. There we go. There's a couple. Oh, there's two in a row. That's even more rare. But you can see the rarity works, and you can just parse through frame by frame and check them out. Let's go see where our data was saved. So if I head over to the root folder, we'll actually see now that I have that CSV document we referenced earlier. I named ghost data. Let's open that up. I pulled it up in Excel here. And as you can see, we just have each variant and it lists each attribute as well as the rarity of that attribute and the material assigned to that attribute all saved here in this one CSV document, which obviously will scale as big as you need it to be however many variants you generate, and however many attributes you give it. For each one, it'll tell you the total number of tickets within that subcollection, as well as the number of tickets for that actual attribute within the subcollection. And I also gave you the rarity readout there as well. But, you know, this is a CSV document, so all the data is just dumped into a CSV document, so you can manipulate it however you need to um, for your own projects.
Make sure you always save and close out of your data document. It'll throw an error at you if you have that CSV document open somewhere. So just when you're done looking at it, make sure to close it out. And the last thing I gave you here was this overwrite function. By default, it's turned on. I don't really know why you would turn it off, but um, if you do turn it off and you happen to generate your document, so we'll generate one right now with it turned off. If we go back over to the CSV document, you'll see we actually just get another top line here right after the last one ended. And it just sort of appends that data onto the previous document. Maybe you want to compare the last generation to this generation um, if you're just running some testing or something. Again, usually I would just keep this turned on for now. I would just keep the override turned on, but just something you have if you want to use it. And there you have it. A variant generation uh, built with 2.1 now supports rarity for attributes as well as a CSV export for your data. So I just wanted to pop in here at the end and just mention a little something else about the rarity system. We talk about the rarity working like a lottery system, right? Well, you know, if it says it's a 17% chance of being selected, that is a benchmark for how generally, how often it's going to be selected. This does not mean at the end of your variations, you're going to have 17% of all of your variations will use that object. Why is that? Well, you have to understand that this number is the chance that it will be selected. This is not the percent that there will be at the end. Those are two very different numbers, right? So if you're generating 20 random objects, but there's a rare item that only comes up one in 500 times, you might not even see that rare item at all within your project. So, you know, you have to just play with these numbers, experiment a little bit and see how they play into a final list of generations. So just keep that in mind is that those are two different numbers the chance it will come up, and the actual amount of times it does exist, right? Two different numbers. Anyway, I'm going to leave you guys with that. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate everyone who's made it this far in the video, as well as everyone who has downloaded the plugin, and especially those who have donated to the plugin. You've made creating this plugin and other projects in my channel just so doable. So I just want to give a huge shout out and a huge thank you to everyone who's donated so far. With that, Drop a comment, leave a like, and subscribe for more projects and videos in the future. Also, be sure to check out my Instagram. I love seeing all the stuff that you guys are working on in the Blender community, as well as uh, being able to just share out new projects and updates to projects like this one here. Till next time, take care.